And I want to welcome you to our expert breakout session for the Mobile and IoT Summit. And this is the session for Kony. And with us this morning, we have Burley Kawasaki, Senior Vice President of Products at Kony. Burley, welcome back to Mobile and IoT Summit. Thanks, Vance. Glad to be here. We're really glad to have Burley with us this morning. He is responsible at Kony for overall product strategy and product management for enterprise mobility. He, in fact, owns planning and delivery against the full product lifecycle of Kony's platform products, which we'll hear a lot more about. And they operate both on-premise and in the cloud. And Burley is quite an authority on cloud, middleware, application development, and, of course, now mobility and IoT with 20-plus years experience in product management and marketing and implementation. In his session this morning, Object-Oriented Microservices Enabling Mobile and IoT, Burley is going to explore the real benefits that architecture and development and even IT operations can derive from a better understanding of object orientation and microservices. You'll see how it empowers both traditional MBAS architectures for better mobile apps, but also this new dimension of IoT and fast data delivery. So just a quick reminder, you can download these slides from Burley if you haven't already done so. You'll see them right in that clicked area under the viewing portion. And we also recommend that you take a look at the other PDF downloads that Burley and his team have assembled for us. They're really quite rich and fabulous. And I also understand, Burley, that we're going to get a demo from you this morning. So with uh, no more delay, let me hand it to you and tell us about object orientation, microservices for mobile and IoT. Thanks, Vance. So I'll be the first to admit that mobile and IoT generate a lot of buzz and hype these days. I think, though, it's important to recognize that there are some very real tensions that this combination of technology disruptions is creating, not just on IT, but also on the business. And I've pulled a few of the stats from industry analysts and from other recent surveys, but if you look at the backlog of demand, over half companies say that they have a backlog of 10, 20 plus apps that they can't get to, right? They want them, they need to move fast enough to keep up with the competition. But the key challenge here is there's this tremendous shortage of talent, right? The, the number of developers available who have really expert skills in mobile development is small, so 94% can't hire the talent they need. And when they do build apps, oftentimes they're subpar, right? In terms of the experience, in terms of the richness of the application, and so often get deleted and utilized. And if I look sort of broadly at sort of what's happening in the mobile industry, it really is calling out for sort of an inflection point to make it simpler, to apply sort of more traditional programming techniques like object orientation to mobile development. If you just use an example, it may date me a little bit, but if you think about the impact that Java had on the industry more broadly, it took a lot of the really powerful and complex aspects and made it simpler, easier to reuse, and really opened up a broader set of mainstream developers that could build apps. And we see the same phenomena happening with microservices as it relates to mobile. Now, this backlog in the demand for talent is only getting more pronounced in terms of the strain or the pressures. And you can see here that, again, 90 plus percent of businesses who have done some type of IoT, they've seen results. And so while it's still a fairly small number today, the business case is compelling. And even this year alone, it will reach almost a $1 trillion market when you look at sort of the hardware and the software opportunity around that. And so what we're going to talk about today is really the intersection point of mobile and IoT. And my thesis statement, if you will, is that IoT creates and generates a ton of very powerful insight about the world, right? With connected devices and sensors that give you all this rich real-time information. But it's really without value unless you can take action upon it, unless you can get insight to it at your fingertips. If you can decide what to do or not do or where you need to improve based on all of the devices in the, the sensors. And so mobility is a huge opportunity when it comes to seeing that information. So mobility, think of this as the interface into your IoT world. Just to give one very sort of, I think, you know, understandable example, think about the smart grid, right? This is something that is, I think, been talked about a lot in the press and the whole sort of supply chain all the way from the utilities that are generating power all the way through the, the transmission systems, the grid, all the way out to the end consumer who is using now smart appliances. They're all wired. Every part of the smart grid value chain is capturing data via sensors, is transmitting this telemetry back and forth. 
But at every point along the way, that information is only as useful as it can be exposed to humans that will take some action. So whether it be sending a real-time alert to a technician who's maintaining or supporting the power generator, giving them real-time work order information so they know what to repair or how to improve its operations. Or it may be an alert to someone who is you know, replacing an appliance in your house, right? And being able to retrieve real-time information about the way it's connected or providing real-time information. And so at every one of these touch points along the full grid, there are needs for a mobile experience of some type. It may not always be through a phone. It might be through increasingly a tablet that gives you a full range of access, it might be even to a watch. In some of the applications now are triggering real-time alerts to you know, end consumers, you know, when they are paid to start using less electricity so that they can get a discount. So these are just examples of sort of the convergence of mobility and IoT happening around us. So let me sort of dive in then, and I'll talk about the underpinnings of these types of new architectures is really based on increasingly this, this topic called microservices. Now, there are those who say microservices in some ways aren't, right, we've been talking about creating structured interfaces, reusable interfaces. This was so broadly enabled in the last decade plus with service-oriented architectures. But I think microservices are taking this even a step further. And so I want to talk about the important role that a microservices architecture can play, both as an underpinning to a mobile development, but also to IoT types of solutions as well. Let's start with mobile. So if you're doing a mobile development project, you may be looking at how do you simplify your integration with backend data and systems. And so commonly these days now there is a range of tools and platforms, sometimes cloud-based, sometimes on-premise, but they're generally referred to as a mobile backend as a service or an MBAS. And these simplify a lot of the core infrastructure, being able to talk to proprietary protocols, translate them back as REST-based services, providing other sort of mobile services like real-time messaging or offline data synchronization. So important role that these MBAS solutions play, but it still requires a lot of developer skill and a lot of development. You're writing code to sort of do something meaningful with all these low-level services. You're having to write a lot of the sort of whole application model or application architecture yourself. And you're having to deploy it and package this through your own sort of operations capability. And so we're, we think there's a need that is unmet. And this is one of the things that Kony has been investing on for the last six or 12 months, we've been building an extension to our MBAS that we refer to as this next generation microservices architecture. And so I'll explain a little bit more about this, but at a high level, what it allows you to do is to abstract away all the low level APIs from your backend and expose this instead as an object model that is really a representation that the application developers are familiar with. So rather than them being familiar with the arcane language of SAP, BAPIs, or rather than having them understand the full set of tables or web services that are exposed through the MBAS, instead let them interact with an object model that is simple and that hides all the complexity and mappings to your backend. And then also allow you to package and group those objects by different relationships. There may be foreign keys, they may have business rules that link them together, but package them into business domains that then you can reuse across your application. And this really takes this world of APIs in, in microservices and makes it much more productive. So let me visualize this for you. So if you think about a traditional MBAS style architecture, you provide this today with Mobile Fabric as well, but it takes your backend systems on the bottom, it then covers that up with a mobile backend as a service layer that exposes these backends as secured mobile APIs in the REST space, so they're easier to call, but they're still very granular. And so when you think about the client app developer, they're writing an awful lot of logic on the mobile device, which has its limitations, right? Because it's creating bigger apps that you have to download. It's a lot of performance of calling multiple APIs that drains battery life, it has slow performance. And so this style of mobile architecture has been around for three to five years and is becoming quite popular, but we think there is a more powerful way to abstract and evolve this application development process. And so with our recent release of Mobile Fabric, we have added on top of this a capability that we call 
object services. And this is an abstraction where we take all of the backend services that are still available if you want to write to the low level code to access them, but instead allows you to pull them together, defining using metadata a series of domain objects that include both the data and the operations that your app developers understand, right? And furthermore, I'll, I'll show you this, we generate for you proxies for all the objects that you simply include into your, your application, whether it be a native app or a phone gap app, that you can then manipulate those objects in a very intuitive way that doesn't require any knowledge of the complexity of the back end. So to make this perhaps a little bit more concrete, I thought what I'd do now is do a quick sort of demonstration. And so Again, for some of you, this may be old hat, at least at the start of this, because you may have been working with a mobile backend as a service before, but just as a little bit of context, you know, if you look on the right, you may have multiple systems of record or backend systems. In this demo, I'm going to mostly focus on SAP, but it may be a newer SaaS-based system like Salesforce, or it could be a traditional set of homegrown other enterprise systems that you've been front-ended with an ESB or an enterprise service bus. And so traditionally, what we've seen many customers move to is implementing a backend as a service. This exposes then all of these sort of low-level APIs out of whatever proprietary protocols that they are typically in into a consistent set of REST-based APIs. And you can optimize them. You can, you can attach uh, policy around who can access them, security, role-based security, et cetera. And so this is a great starting point for many of our customers who want to start to, again, have a consistent way of obtaining data and business process logic from the back end. But as I said before, there's still a tremendous amount of complexity in order to understand and navigate through all these APIs. And you think about this explosion we talked about of not just a couple of mobile apps, but moving to 10 or 20 or more apps that your development teams are working on, they need an easier way to consume and reuse uh, these APIs. And so what we've introduced with object services is a set of capabilities in our tooling to allow you to create these object models. The object model is an abstraction, and it's an abstraction that should be done by the app development team so that you can model this in a business context and a domain that is very closely linked to the way that you want to reuse this across applications. So it may have no resemblance to the mess or the ugly <laughs> APIs that get surfaced on the back end, but it really it's a clean representation, very close to the way that your applications need that. And so, you know, what I'll do is I'll show you how to very quickly jump in to our mobile fabric console. Just for the limits of the demo, what I'm going to show is really sort of two objects, an order, and order item, and how those get defined. So let me dive right in. So this is our web-based mobile fabric console. Um, along the top, there's a set of tabs that are wizard that effectively allow you to configure any of the backend services. So you might create a new identity a service to link to Active Directory or perhaps to some other SAML or OAuth2 compliant identity provider. Integration is where you can leverage and reuse some of our business adapters to get connectivity to SAP or Salesforce or other systems. But the one I'm going to highlight now is the newer object services. So if you see the objects tab, this is what allows you to define these higher level reusable component objects that you can then reuse across your applications. So if I go ahead now and I will go up and click in the objects tab, what you'll see is that it takes me first to, to configure a new object. Since I haven't done this any already, first it prompts me for the name of the domain. So these uh, are part of the orders domain. I'm going to secure all the objects in this domain against SAP's identity provider. This could be AD or could be CML, but I'm just using uh, SAP in this example. So now I have the ability to go in and I'm going to configure a couple of objects. We'll do order and order item. And this will be a very sort of brief example, but it'll give you the sense for how easy it is to create these reusable components. So I'm going to go in, I've created an order object. I can see now that I can assign fields to it. So a typical object may have dozens or hundreds of fields. I'm just going to make this simple, an order ID, company, order type, account, description. I'm going to do the same for order item. So just again, a few that will give you a sense for the type of data, whether it be an order ID, product ID, quantity that's part of the order item. These objects also have relationships. So I may link the order and order item. In this case, it's a one-to-many relationship. These relationships are important when it comes to enforcing uh, data integrity, right? If I delete an order, I need to delete all the order items associated with it. Or if I want to take the data offline later, again, I need to know the scope of how much data to pull offline. So just in a matter of a minute or so, 
done uh, some pretty powerful things. I haven't had to understand anything at all about the back end, but I've just defined from a business or an application domain a couple of the core objects. Now, in the real world, there would be more fields, more relationships. I, I would have added probably realistic data types. If you were watching, you, you saw I defaulted everything to string, but I could pick numeric or Boolean or other data types. And that's important from a business validation standpoint so that as I'm interacting with these when I'm writing my app, that it knows how to validate the creation of new data and enforces that through the constraints of the object model. Okay, so that's the first step, which is I've created this order and order item object. But those we need to talk to somehow and be mapped against a number of these backend APIs. And so I could drop into code now and I could write a lot of get methods to call and, and pull data back from these APIs and transform them into the format needed for order and order item. But instead, I'm gonna use within object services a whole series of mapping and transformation tools that allow me to define those once, you know, have those rules enforced as part of the cloud service, and then simply return the resultant data and, and process information in the transform state back to the app developer. And then link those to the set of APIs on the back end coming from SAP in this case, but again, it could be from multiple systems where the data actually lives. So let me just progress the demo. I'll start where I left off, which is we've created two objects, order and order item. Now I'm going to go in and start creating the mappings. And so here you can see I'm pulling from backend APIs and SAP. If you're familiar with SAP sort of terminology, they're fairly cryptic. And now I'm linking visually the order ID to the order number. I'm going through and connecting my object fields to backend API fields. Some, in most cases, the descriptions are different. You can also change the relationship. Is it two-way synchronization? Is it one-way? Perhaps the, the order number needs to be generated from the back end, and you, you don't allow the, the client side to create a unique order ID. So I go through, and I can map not just the data, but in this case, also, I can invoke business logic. So in this case, there may be mapping a get method on the order to a get method that SAP exposes that forms some sort of business logic. Now, if I need to do something more complex, which is often the case, I may need to do some filtering or I need to do some transformation. We also have a powerful mapping language based on XML that allows you to drop into and do much more sophisticated transformations and massaging of the data. But again, this is a pretty powerful example of how easy it is to take data from the front end of the, sort of the cleanliness of an application data model or object model and then map it to your low level APIs. Now, you may be saying, in some cases, that's great, I have a lot of these complex mappings, but in other cases, perhaps, maybe the data that's already in my backend system may be close enough that I want to just inherit all of the, the rules that are in it. Because in most cases, like SAP, it may have the sort of defined objects, it may have relationships, it may have a lot of existing sort of built-in rules. And so, I'll show you how easy it is we can make it to import those rules as well. So, starting again, this time going over to the generate button. And what this is allowing you to do is to call out into discover the metadata. In this case, it's coming from SAP. So you can pull up now a list of the objects that are exposed to the SAP API. I can check the ones that I want to import and use to generate my object model. So in this case, I hit generate. I could simplify the names and come up with more human-friendly or developer-friendly names, but I'll, I'll leave them the way they are for right now. And so you see now I've fully populated all of the objects on my data model. I also have already defined the relationships because SAP application data already had the mappings and cardinality rules between order item and other parent-child tables. In this case, it also has already pre-mapped all of the front-end fields to back-end fields as well. Now, at this point, again, I probably would go in and start to modify it. Maybe there's some of the generated fields that I don't really need. Maybe I want to simplify the, the names. And so you can go through this, but you can see how easy it is to, to do this in just really a matter of minutes. So we've, we've taken this now quite a ways, but we're not done yet. So we've generated for you this high-level abstraction. We've mapped it to your backend data and APIs. Now the question is, what's the experience for a client-side developer to be able to invoke those and to reuse those as part of their application? And so we expose all these higher-level objects as REST-based APIs, and so you can call it from any type of development tools or frameworks that you may use, whether it be native or PhoneGap or 
HTML5, JavaScript, but we go further than that. So in addition to REST-based APIs, we also provide SDKs that allow you to take advantage of higher level development capabilities, and we generate for you proxies for all the objects. And so you can copy and paste in the pre-generated proxy code that allows you to say things like get order, get order item, and it will automatically generate for you all the code you need. Plus it also provides you all the libraries needed for automatic offline data synchronization. So for example, it generates a small SQLite database for you. It detects whether you're online or offline and automatically your application will inherit the capability of working offline, handling all the conflict resolution and other complex validation once you become connected again in the future. Let me just briefly show you how simple that thing is one use case of offline data synchronization. So I'll go back into the console, I'll click on the synchronization tab, and at this point, all I need to do is to create a, a set of rules that define the policy. So in this case, I'll create an order sync policy. I can define whether I want it to always sync in real time to the back end. In some cases, I may want to cache some data in case the back end is down. So I can use persistent sync to sync copy to the cloud. And then I can also define business rules where I'm simultaneously making updates from the client and the server. I may want the client to always win. I may want the server to win. Or you can go in and you can write custom logic to handle those types of resolutions. But very powerful, and that's all I need to do to now have my application enabled for automatic offline functionality. So that was a very quick tour and in demo. There's a number of things that we provide from Kony that really cover the full life cycle. We have design tools, we have front end development, we have back end and analytics capabilities. But if you just look at the integration sort of step of any life cycle project, what I've just shown you can achieve a 75% reduction in back end integration. That's for a media map complexity. And this is something that we've benchmarked using sort of TCO and other models for many of our clients. And so very powerful, but I wanted to give you a taste for what some of the latest capabilities are for simplifying backend integration through this new object-oriented microservices approach. We've talked a lot about mobile, but now let me bridge and talk to some of the additional opportunities related to IoT. And to be clear, as I said at the beginning of this session, IoT is still very early on. There are not a lot of customers today who have fully rolled out IoT initiatives. But I think those that do are seeing results. Also, we see that almost half of enterprises are using some type of IoT-related technologies to monitor their production distribution. So more and more parts of the manufacturing or supply chain are already wired, providing data in some type. And increasingly, it's based on some system protocols. And so this really creates an appetite and an opportunity for really exploiting this through some of the latest developments from IoT. And so what we've done is we've introduced a new set of services into mobile fabric as well that not only supports mobile scenarios, but also supports IoT and lets you combine the two. And so what this means is that now not only can we talk to all the mobile SDKs and, and sort of OS requirements, but we can also talk to devices, whether it be HTTP or co-app protocols, which are two of the more common ones. But we now can talk to a device collaborate or combine data from the device along with other line of business data, and then use that to power some sort of experience that may be surfaced to an end user. This is part of really a broader sort of spectrum of an IoT architecture. At the highest level, I could spend an hour probably walking through this, but if you think about the whole flow that starts with the things, the devices, the, the sensors on the left, they need to talk some protocol, which I just talked to, but that creates this stream of data and events that needs to be ingested. Sometimes, though, devices don't work or they may sort of be working too well that they're producing duplicate data. And so you need to have an architecture that allows you to understand the state of a device or a sensor, allows you to process this, to analyze it using analytics. And then finally, you need to combine it in most cases with some other type of business or operational data, an SAP or a backend system, and then correlate the things that matter, whether it be related to a high priority customer, SLA that you're about to miss, or being able to link it in real time to a work order that's being worked on by someone in your field technician group. And so that's where the interaction points with mobile occur. That end-to-end -end architecture is very difficult for any one company to do by themselves. Kony has partnered very closely with Amazon in taking advantage of some of the innovation that Amazon Web Services is now providing. So many of you may be familiar with AWS from an infrastructure as a service platform in the cloud, but you may be less familiar with, they also have been introducing a 
very broad spectrum of IoT services for each of the phases that I mentioned in the life cycle. And Kony has been working very closely with Amazon to find the appropriate ways to extend and integrate their core sort of cloud-based infrastructure to support a number of other enterprise requirements. Again, I could talk to for an hour in terms of what's needed in an overall IoT architecture, but the point being that when you want to start combining IoT and mobile, that we have a full end-to-end reference architecture and joint solution working with Amazon that can meet those needs. Just one example to sort of tie everything we've been talking about together to the mobile and IoT intersection. There's a customer that we're working with, a joint customer of both Amazon and, and Kony, and it's, it's really to support a, a connected car scenario. And so a lot of you probably, if you've got a newer model car, it's starting to have a lot of sensors and a lot of intelligent telemetry that it generates back to the manufacturer. This isn't just for the efficiency of repairs or warranty for the manufacturer, but increasingly there is value that can be exposed to the driver or to the owner. And so in this case, the manufacturer is building a mobile app so that you as, a, as, as the owner of the car can get real-time information. Let's say you're suddenly notified that your car is driving 70 miles away and it's exceeded the geofence that you put around <laughs> your town, right? Well, maybe that's an indication that your car is being stolen. Right? Or if you know your car is being stolen, you don't want to, to stop the engine, do you want to turn on the horn, there's other remote control types of activities that you may take, and it's really blending the real-time control from a mobile device with the sensors and the control that's built into the auto itself. And so incredible opportunities, this is just one example of a number of really leveraging the cloud types of services and, and huge volumes of event stream-based data from IoT devices, along with mobile as a customer experience that allows you to make sense upon to act in real time, and then how you can leverage and sort of combine all those APIs into an overall microservices-based architecture. We're about ready to wrap up and we'll have a little bit of Q&A, so I just want to say a few sort of final remarks. First of all, regardless of where you are, maybe you're building you know, a few mobile apps to get started, or you may think this is old hat and you've got dozens some customers we talk to have hundreds of apps that they've bought or they've built in-house. But I would suggest that you need to think about how do you align and prepare your mobile strategy to prepare for IoT, right? And architecturally, you need to think about some of the different layers and standards that you will need to future-proof your mobile apps and your mobile architecture to support the IoT world. Does, does your architecture anticipate and support some of the different IoT protocols? Do they support this notion of devices that may not always be connected, but may be sort of fluctuating between on and offline? So these are some of the many considerations that you need to make sure are part of your planning and your mobile strategy. The second recommendation I would make is really build for change. IoT is still emerging. There are a ton of innovations at all levels of hardware, software, protocols, and the industry is learning fast, but that means that the things that you build on today may be obsolete in six months or 12 months or 24 months. And so instead of building point to point and sort of taking very sort of hand-coded sort of approaches, it's really important that you look at middleware that keeps you above that and that you can really benefit from a lot of the improvements and enhancements that the hardware and software vendors will be doing and that allows you to, to focus your application teams really on the things that matter, the types of differentiated experiences that will really delight your customers and provide greater value to your stakeholders. So that's enough about mobility and IoT. I want to just Briefly introduce Kony. If you haven't heard of Kony, we are one of the early pioneers in the mobile sort of enterprise uh, solutions space. We are the largest pure play vendor out there. We are often compared to many of the enterprise platform vendors like IBM, SAP, Oracle, Microsoft. But unlike any of the other players, we are the only one that is focused 100% on mobility. That's all we do, that's all we think about, and that focus gives us the ability to move in a very agile way to keep up with the increasing needs of the industry. We have over 1,200 employees, 500 of which are focused on R&D and innovation and mobility. When you look at our customers, we think about this in terms of their usage, number of users, number of sessions, number of apps, and we've seen, I think, a tremendous amount of recognition, both by our customers, but also by the industry analysts, Gartner, Forrester, all agree that we are one of the leaders in our respective market. So if you want to learn more, we have a lot that we can share with you. 
you can find online some of the PDFs and other information that are part of this presentation and event. But you can also go directly to our website if you want to learn more about mobile fabric. There's a ton of information online, tutorials. You can also sign up for a free 90-day trial. And so you can go really get hands-on, understand what are some of the opportunities for building microservice-based architectures for either mobile or IoT or likely both. So I encourage you to try this out and certainly engage us if you have any questions. So with that, Vance, back to you. Burley, what a fantastic session. And I love the architecture conversation talking about the way that we're looking kind of at a next-gen, more intelligent MS. So really great session. Thank you, Vance. You know, certainly, Burley, many of our attendees here, both from the developer as well as the data provider and the integration professional, they all understand the basic concepts of using APIs to make mobile apps faster and perhaps less complicated for developers. But your conversation of bringing object services or microservices, it sounds like Coney's really trying to make MBASs smarter for the front end developer so that they can get that back end data or service into their app much easier. I wonder if you could just spend a minute or two talking about the reaction you've heard from customers about how you're moving MBAS to a much more, let's say, agile way of putting the front end developer and the back end people on the same page. That's a great question. And you hit the nail on the head, if you will, with, with the term agile. I think one of the ahas that many of our customers realize is when they do the first project or two, I mean, that has its challenges, but it is relatively straightforward to understand how to integrate on an app-by-app basis to their backend, often using an embass. But when you start trying to do this at scale, not just one or two, but maybe five or 10, then that's really when you start realizing some of the opportunity for reuse. And it's harkens back again to, I think, the days when SOA was early on and they were trying to also provide guidance and architectures to help promote and support reuse of web services. And so if you're trying to reuse these mobile APIs, you need a way to be able to to find them and to also not just have to rewrite a lot of the plumbing code, but to really encapsulate them in higher level ways. And so object services, we've been working with customers for a while now in a part of our beta and feedback loop. And again, the productivity benefit they get when they start reusing is tremendous. It allows them to reuse on a much more ready basis. And that not only cuts down on development time, but it also cuts down on support and maintenance to a very significant amount. Let's drill a bit into the user experience, certainly for the front end person at least. The question comes in, how does the Coney solution with the objects and microservices change how the front end application developer or maybe even the ALM process work, given that we're not just calling a big nest of APIs, but working with smarter objects? You can continue to build your client-side apps using whatever tool or framework that you may be already using, but this really helps make it simpler and it enables you to write less code and focus the code that you are writing more on the business logic and on creating tremendous and stunning user experiences and not have to worry about plumbing of finding massaging data. You know, it's a really good point there, Burley, because there's another question here that talks about how it kind of helps the front end and the back end folks communicate better. And the question simply says, we've used MBAS for quite a while to accelerate our mobile apps, but we've always run into the roadblock of the API or the service that the developer needs isn't always there. Is there a way that the new approach that Coney has is going to help us create a better library of services that developers need? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's where the ability to take sort of granular APIs and then reuse them in new ways without having to, to drop down into code or talk to the API developer. It's as simple as going into the mapping of the data objects that I showed. And so I can create new flavors or new mappings of the data objects without having to write any code or having to build new APIs. So it's really a mashup type activity. So I think it's absolutely enabling developers to go and to quickly combine or recombine APIs. So if there isn't an object that's available, I showed in the, in the demo how easy it is to go into the tools to create perhaps a new object that maps the same APIs differently. So that becomes a very easy sort of mashup that you can do without having to go back to the original API developer. And then you can take that component, I can publish it out to other developers on my team or across the organization that may want to reuse it. 
Excellent, excellent. You know, you've got one convert here already, Burley. Here's a question or comment that says, I love this auto-generating of back-end data objects. Can the speaker please address what types or from what vendors we can automatically create these back-end data sources to work with? That's a great question, and a lot of it depends on being able to discover and introspect on metadata. And so a lot of the line of business systems like SAP or, or Salesforce provide that ability to discover metadata through their interfaces. And so we can do that readily, and I showed you that in SAP. But we also have the ability to go in to any web service. So we have what we call our service-driven objects. And so it can discover essentially the service description from WSGL, and then in a likewise way, be able to automatically import those definitions into Fabric. So we can do it either through sort of line of businesses that enable metadata discovery, or through just plain old web services. Excellent. Excellent. You know, here's another question kind of goes to your schematic and your demo here, Burley. It says, I totally understand how I can actually use the Coney object services to get my data into a mobile app, but can I also post data back to my enterprise systems? Absolutely. And that's something that maybe I didn't hit on when I did the demo scenario, but this is a two-way mapping or can be. In some cases, I think I mentioned how you might want the backend system to be the owner of things like auto-generated order ID, but likewise, most of the fields and data will be two-way. And this is where it's really important to have the cardinality rules between objects so that if I'm making an update on one object, it knows, oh, I need to update the other objects that are related to it. Or if I'm offline and I've updated a few objects, then when I come back online, which are the ones that are linked to the transaction from a business process standpoint, I need to replay all those and I need to make sure that they get updated into the back end appropriately. So this is absolutely a two-way process. And although I didn't show it, there's a bunch of capabilities that handle the conflict resolution in both ways so that if you're in simultaneous updates, that it knows intelligently how to resolve them. Excellent, excellent. You know, a couple of questions here on IoT before we let you go, Burley. And the question simply says, can the speaker please explain a bit more about what they see as an optimized IoT lifecycle or architecture? The starting point for many of our customers is simply to start instrumenting the physical world through intelligent devices. More and more of these already talk at least HTTP or one of the protocols like CoAP. And so that may be the starting point. And then over time, I would say sort of the next phase is starting to figure out how to combine that data and the events with other business or operational data. That's where Mobile Fabric helps you combine and link the device data, the back-end data from SAP, for example, combine them and then show mobile experience. And that's an early step. And then I would say sort of the third phase or maybe fourth phase for some of our customers is when they start really getting volumes of data and they start seeing the power, then they want to start getting insight from it. And so that's where a lot of the, the real-time predictive analytics or the, the broad sort of event stream analytics really comes to bear and that can help them drive tremendous business value. So those are sort of three steps that are common for many of our customers. You know, this convergence between your attention to mobile or MS powered apps and now IoT has triggered kind of a connecting of the dots question. And it simply says here, Burley, I'm putting together Mobile Fabric's capability for mobile apps and IoT data streams. And it seems like we would be able to do a lot with embedded analytics for our mobile apps now, if not quite soon. Can the speaker comment on that? That's correct. Yeah. And we go through all of the mobile fabric capabilities, but a component that you get out of the box with mobile fabric is a full set of analytics. And there's both standard reports and analytics we give you on user or app or session sort of activities, but we give you the power to create your own reports through built-in report writers and dashboard tools. And you can also add custom data that you may want to track from your application. So there's a very powerful set of mobile analytics that you may be already collecting or could automatically collect simply by turning on some of the SDK capabilities in your apps and then combine that with, as you know, we talked about, and all the range of data and events coming from the external IoT sensors, and you have a very powerful combination. You know, Burley, this has been a fantastic session and a really eye-opener. I think the folks love the concept of MBAS, but when it get to gut to actually getting to scale of dozens and hundreds of apps, it may have been something that they needed a few supercharged components from. This certainly responds to that issue and gets them ready for IoT. Can you give us a sense of how folks can get 
more information on how the latest convergence between mobile fabric and object services can be used, maybe even that free trial you talked about. Well, yeah, I'd certainly recommend going to our website. We have a ton of how-to samples and tutorials you can walk through with or without the free trial. And if you want to get hands-on and you want to start trying to build an app, then we'll give you a cloud-hosted version of Mobile Fabric, completely at no cost. You can try it out. We give you then additional samples to get started. So I would absolutely encourage everyone to try it out. Fantastic. Burley Kawasaki, Senior Vice President of Products at Coney. Thanks very much for a great session and a glimpse into what is certainly on its way down the pike, this convergence between mobile and IoT and making it a lot easier for the front-end developer to boot. Thanks again for a great session. Thank you, Vince. And as we love to do here at Mobile and IoT Summit, Burley mentioned quite a number of resources. We're going to put a slide up here that summarizes many of the top of mind ones. And you can just click through on these links and get right to those resources. And again, a quick reminder, the PDFs that are here in the breakout room are available for you right now with no extra registration. Thanks again, everyone.